Well, this morning we continue our series, which we've called Focus. And focus is important. We need clarity to discern detail, to distinguish the dominant from the distractions. Focus delivers clear understanding to a story and helps us determine our next step forward. Photographers know that focus is fundamental to their pictures. Speaking of photography, just last week, a photo made headlines around the world. A photo of a group of superstars that got a lot of people very excited. <laughs> oh, hang on. Uh, that's, that's, that's the wrong photo. Um, sorry. Let me start again. Focus. Focus. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, a photo made headlines around the world. A photo of a group of super stars that got a lot of people very excited. <laughs> this photo of space was taken by the James Webb Telescope, which is currently about 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. It uses infrared technology to capture images of the universe never seen before. According to NASA, it's the deepest and sharpest infrared image of the distant universe to date. Forbes magazine describes this as the single most important image in astronomy's history. You'll see that most of those splotches of light in the picture aren't stars. They're galaxies, hundreds of galaxies, each containing hundreds of of billions of stars. When you start reading up on space, the numbers that they use to describe size and distance make your brain start to hurt. So many zeros. Suffice to say, space is big. Sometimes, sometimes we think we're pretty big. I remember being a little kid and wanting to be bigger. Being big as a kid is kind of, that's a, that's a big deal. I remember when I grew as tall as my mum. Now that was a major milestone. And then so growing as tall as dad, that was, that was going to be the next big achievement. And then when I grew taller than my dad, well, that was, you know, I knew I'd, I'd made it then. That was, that was the pinnacle for me. And now I'm a dad and I've watched my boys grow up and talk about how big they want to be when they grow up and they grew as tall as their mum, and that was a big achievement. And then they grew as big as me, and I started thinking, oh, hang on. And now my oldest son, Flynn, who turned 18 last week, towers over me. So my space in the world is not quite as big as what it used to be. So I want us now just to think for a little moment about you and about your size and about the space that you take up on the planet alongside almost 8 billion other people on this planet, hurtling through space. Now I want to talk a little bit about perspective. If the planet that we are on, Earth, was reduced to the size of a grain of sand, can you imagine what that looks like, how big a grain of sand is? put it next to the sun, the sun would be about the size of a billiard ball. Perspective. If this is the sun, if this is the size of the sun, and I put this on the try line of a football field, and we set a football field going lengthways that way, and then add another football field on the end of that, and then do the same going this way, one football field, then another football field, that is the width of our solar system, with all the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and we'll throw in Pluto too, just because it got decommissioned a few years ago, but we, we want to bring it back. <laughs> so that is the size of our solar system. Now, if we, were, if we were to reduce our solar system down to the size of a grain of sand, in our Milky Way galaxy, that's our own galaxy, one of 
billions of galaxies. In the Milky Way galaxy, our solar system, the size of a grain of sand, the size of our galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy, would stretch 50 kilometers. It's good to get some perspective. So back to the James Webb photo. So to put this photo in context, with all these other galaxies contained in this photo, if this photo were a window that we were to look out of into the universe, we'd need to reduce it down to the size of a grain of sand and then hold it out at arm's length. And that's how much of space this photo captures. It's incredible. Space is big. If we want to catch a glimpse of God's greatness, all we need to do is look up. We have a ways to go to catch up and keep track of the wonder that he has made. The prophet Isaiah wrote this, Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. When was the last time that we let the splendor of God's creation affect us? Or have we turned out, tuned out to our surroundings to such a degree that we barely give such indescribable wonder a second thought? Are we more captivated by lesser things? Our encouragement today is to look up. Look up from our busyness. Look up from our worries. Look up from our grand plans. Look up from our phones. Look up, like it says in the song that we've just sung, in awesome wonder as we consider all the works his hands have made. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. The Bible from beginning to end is the story of God inviting his people to know him. All creation points to him. The magnitude, the beauty, the precision, the order, the power. Even the most renowned scientists who devote their whole lives to understanding the world around us and the heavens above us get to the point of saying, we just, we just don't know. We're, we're only barely scratching the surface. We thought there were 100 billion galaxies, and now thanks to this new James Webb Telescope, it's, you know, it could be 200 billion. We, we just don't know. Even those who deny God's existence are continually confronted with this dilemma of an awareness of power and intelligence beyond our understanding. In Romans, the Apostle Paul wrote this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. When people really have to think about their place in the world, the purpose for our existence, it's easier, it's, it's much easier to make excuses or to plead ignorance, to not think too hard about it to find distractions, to be deluded by illusions of our own greatness. Because if we do dare to ask those big questions, at the end of the line are answers people don't want to face up to. Because it will reveal that we're not quite as in control as we would like to be. And so expectations about our existence are reduced to more manageable, palatable, convenient and comfortable size. Theologian John Piper warns of the consequences of setting our standard of wonder too low. He writes, if you can't see the sun, you will be impressed with a street light. If you've never felt thunder and lightning, you'll be impressed with fireworks. And if you turn your back on the greatness and majesty of God, 
you'll fall in love with a world of shadows and short-lived pleasures. See, deep within us, we know that short-lived pleasures will never satisfy. There is a longing for something more, to know that we matter, that there's a purpose to our lives, that there is something beyond. In Ecclesiastes, one of the Bible's books of wisdom, we read this. God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. See, God wants us to know, to, just, to not just know about him, but to know him and to know him better. And whilst creation is beautiful and amazing and awe-inspiring, its purpose is to point us to the Creator. In Him, our peace and purpose is found in this life and into eternity. The Bible, from beginning to end, is the story of God inviting His people to know Him. And it's a long story because our story, the story of humankind, is one of constant drifting away from God. In the beginning, God created a perfect world and two perfect people, Adam and Eve. But they were tempted to think that their way would, would be better than God's way. And they found out the hard way that they were wrong. They discovered that their sin their rebellion against God's way caused a great divide between them and their creator and so set the course of sin in the human condition. Separation, shame, brokenness, these painful effects of sin continue to be experienced today. In our desolate and despondent state, our tired eyes downcast, there is a gentle voice that whispers, look up. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will ne neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. What amazing grace. What incredible mercy. The God of the universe wants you to know that he sees you and that you matter. How can that be? The psalmist penned that same question. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. In the grand scheme of the universe, with measurements of billions and trillions, what is mankind that God is mindful of us? Who are we that God would care for us? The Bible tells us that God not only cares for us, but knows us far deeper than we know ourselves. Again, the psalmist writes, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So not only did God know about you and value you before you were even conceived, he had a plan and a purpose for your life. And at the top of that list was for you to get to know him and his love for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's through Jesus that we learn what God is like. Last week, 
If you were here or watched us online, last week Ross spoke about our need to look to the cross. When we look to the cross, we see the ultimate example of humility. We see that Jesus, being in very nature God, creator of the universe, demonstrated his love for us by humbling himself to die on a cross so that we could know him better. His death provided forgiveness for our sin, a way out of hell, which is where we were headed, and a guarantee eternal life with God for those who choose to believe in him. Jesus demonstrated humility in his obedience to God's way. Humility is the first step that we must take. God is God and I am not. Choosing his way with every step is the best thing for us. Now, I wish it was as easy to do that as to say it. The story of humankind is one of constant drifting away from God, succumbing to the very first temptation that was recorded in the Bible when the serpent spoke to Eve saying, you will be like God. In other words, you get to decide what's best for you. What feels right for you is all that matters. Things will be better if you're in charge. See, we like control. And that's why technology and social media are so appealing. So much power in such a small device. I was watching an interview with Andy Crouch, a Christian author who made a very interesting observation. As humans, we are made for personal connection. Technology has helped with these connections, letter writing, telegrams, the telephone, emails. But as things have advanced, the technological world in now, that we now live in has become very personalized. It's a version of personal but it's not quite the real deal. Their algorithms crack the codes of what we like to watch and read and listen to and provide us with more of what we like to watch and read and listen to. News feeds, music playlists, video recommendations, it's all personalized. And it gives us the impression that our technology is paying attention to us. It's very alluring. My iPhone pays attention to me with a continuous presence that no person does. It feels like the world is responding to me. Trapped in an echo chamber, I only hear about things that align with my point of view. And there's a comfort and a safety in that. There's no need to build resilience when it seems that everyone agrees with me. The world has become personalized, but not personal. To be personal requires vulnerability, and that can be scary. Life is so much easier when everything goes my way, when people tell me what I want to hear. But to be open to different opinions, to consider the interests of others above my own, that takes humility. It opens us up to the possibility that my way might not be the best way. Maybe there's someone else who knows how the world is supposed to work. Maybe someone like the God who created it all. The job of our enemy is not to convince us that God doesn't exist. Satan only needs needs to keep us distracted from God, to keep us from looking up. Don't look up. All you need is right here and here and here and here. He only needs to create enough noise to drown out that still small voice of God. So while technology is creating a more personalized world, our personal connections are crumbling with one another and with God. Last week, we heard about some of the census results in relation to the rise in people identifying as having no religion. 
A new question was added to the census last year regarding the types of long-term health conditions people are experiencing. Topping that list was people struggling with their mental health. Now, I'm not claiming a direct correlation between the two, but there's an interesting discussion around resilience that relates to both areas. Resilience is a popular concept these days, the capacity to get back on track when dealing with the issues that inevitably come our way. Something difficult in life happens, and it's up to us to muster the courage and the strength to implement the skills to overcome that difficulty. Believe in yourself. That's the catch cry. But as Christians, we believe that resilience is imparted. Over and over again, the Bible highlights that it's God's strength that we rely on. The battle belongs to the Lord. Paul prays for the early church in Ephesus with this truth. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Salvation is not just about going to heaven when you die. It's about God's spirit living within us, empowering us, guiding us, nourishing our souls. So the question is, how's your soul? Anyone feeling a little bit weary? Anything happened in, say, the last couple of years that's taken a toll on you? Any disruptions? or inconveniences. We thought that life was exhausting enough leading up to 2020, and then COVID hit and sped up that spin. Lockdowns, isolation, working from home, schooling from home, masks, panic buying, throw in some major floods, cost of living, rising, and then If you've been part of this church community over the last couple of years, you'll know it hasn't been exactly smooth sailing either. And now here we are again, riding the third wave of COVID. So in the midst of uncertainty and instability going on all around us, the question for you is, how's your soul? How much attention are you paying to your soul? We can often overlook or downplay the effect or deny the effect that these life-changing events, um, we can deny the effect that they have on our lives. It's the fighting Aussie spirit to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get on with it. Now, it's not so much the one-off catastrophic event that causes things to fall apart. It's the constant Little things that left unattended cause major problems. The death by a thousand cuts. The straw that breaks the camel's back. Speaking of camels, in the opening pages of his book, Resilient, John Eldridge writes about the resilience of camels. Their ability to carry heavy loads over miles and miles of hot desert sand is legendary. But they have one weakness. Camels will continue strong with no warning sign of weakness or slowing down until they drop dead. And there's a tendency to treat our souls the same way. To push on through the heat to persevere through the storms, to bear the heavy burdens. Then the next challenge comes along and everything falls apart. If you look at what's happened in the world over the last couple of years and the impact that it's had on churches, there is cause for concern. Following the pandemic lockdowns, many, many long-term churchgoers have given up on going back to church. You may have heard of the recent great resignation where people used the changes brought on by COVID to explore a different career path. Well, it seems the same thing has happened in churches. 
Sure, some people use the opportunity to try out a different church, but many resigned from church altogether. And sadly, many have also resigned from the faith. People deconstructing their faith has become a trendy thing to do. Pulling apart your faith to discover why you believe what you believe, which sounds like a good exercise to do, particularly when you're spiritually healthy and vibrant. But when it's done in a state of spiritual exhaustion and fragmented attention and perhaps bitterness and disappointment or frustration, faith in God is deconstructed to only be left lying in pieces on the floor. But faith is not something that can be discarded. It's simply replaced by something else. Our search for meaning and purpose remains in play. And the world today is not lacking in its offerings of shadows and short-term pleasures. Our society has an increasing reluctance to look up. As Christians, looking up should be our first point of call. We know our inner being was created for union with God. It's something that must be practiced and cultivated. In a world full of noise and endless distractions, we must make time for stillness and quiet. To humble ourselves, to focus our attention and our affection on God. And this is not just about filling our head with knowledge about God, although that is important. It's taking time to be with God, acknowledging his presence within us and around us, using his word to guide our thoughts. Jesus likened our connection with him in this way. He said, I am the vine and you are are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. As a church, as a faith community, we want to bear fruit. We want to keep God's kingdom moving forward. We want to do a lot of stuff and we do do a lot of stuff. There are There's ministry and there are programs happening every day through the week here. Without those deliberate moments to pause and to seek God, all that we do is in vain. It's done in vanity. It's done out of pride. It's look at what we've done. Look at the tiny kingdom that we've built. That's not what we're about. We desperately need God. Nothing is possible without him and all things are possible with him. We need his help. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. If you've not come along to our 5 p.m. prayer service on a Sunday night, I want to invite you to come along. There is plenty of encouragement in the Bible to pray together. Now, there's no pressure to pray out loud or to use fancy churchy words when you pray. Just being there and praying together is what's important. We want to be able to provide an opportunity for people to connect with God and one another in a personal way. To surrender the worries of the world to him. To humble ourselves and to look up. Look up to the one who's got the whole world in his hands. Look up to the one who wants us to know him better. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, our Redeemer and our rest. Lord, in these uncertain times, there are many who are weary, 
many who are exhausted physically, mentally, spiritually. Lord, we need you. Thank you that you know us. You know where we're at and your grace meets us right there. We come humbly to you. Forgive us, Lord, when we go ahead in our own strength. We want to rest in your love and work in your strength. Guide us with your wisdom. Help us to keep looking up to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.